ever done, that you'll ever do. And He loved you anyway. Amen. And He called you into His fold. And He had compassion on you. And He gave everything for you. Isn't that someone to fall in love with? Amen. Amen. All right, turn to chapter 8. Let's look at verses 1 through 9. Now I want you to notice the progression of the multitude. The progression of the multitude. It says that a multitude followed him, a multitude followed him. Now we come to chapter 8. Ray, will you read verses 1, hold on, 1 through 9? And in those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples unto him and saith unto him, unto them, I have compassion on the multitude, because they have now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away fasting to their own houses, they will faint by the way, for divers of them came from afar. And his disciples answered him, from whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? And he asked them, How many loaves had ye? And they said, Seven. And he commanded the people to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and gave thanks and break, and gave to his, his disciples to set before them. And they did set them before the people. And they had a few small fishes, and he blessed and commanded to set them also before them. So they did eat, and they were filled. And they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets, and they went, and they that had eaten were about four thousand. And okay. he sent them away. So now it only took two chapters. Two chapters for them to forget what Jesus did with five thousand. Now this is a thousand less. Same situation, really. Now, I want you to think about this. How many days were these people with Jesus? Three days. And they had nothing to eat. Three days. Now, we sit in church here, and if I go past 1230, <laughs> especially the potluck day, there are people ready to stand up and walk away. Now you're talking about it. I hope you wore steel to the boots. Listen, I bring this to your attention to let you realize what a great teacher Jesus must have been. How many of us are willing to sit three days to hear a pastor? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But didn't they say of Jesus, no man ever spoke like this man? We have his words in print. They got to hear them. They got to see him. They got to touch him. But listen, Jesus gives us his Holy Spirit. And because of the power of that Holy Spirit, the Spirit now is able to bring to our minds and our hearts the person of Jesus Christ. So He can be just as real to us as He was to them. Listen, you've seen the one word that has been in every one of these texts that we've read? It's that word, compassion. And it's throughout the Gospels that Jesus had compassion. It is used 13 times. The phrase move with compassion is used 13 times in the New Testament. And usually it has to do with Jesus. Move with compassion. Listen, you can go through the book of Matthew and see even more of these stories. Some of them are the same of Jesus having compassion. But what I like about the book of Mark is, like I said, it's just boom, boom, boom. One event after another, after another, after another. Do you see the progression? At this point in chapter 8, the multitudes have become very great. That Jesus doesn't have room to walk because the people crowd him. How many of you like crowds and being in crowds? Anybody? Look at me. Nobody raising their hands. I don't like crowds. They freak me out. Uh, can you imagine... Let's take Disney World. You've been to Disney World? Yeah. See how many people are there? When you first go to Disney World, you get off, whether it's a train, the boat, or whatever it is, and they herd you in. <laughs> yes, like cattle. They herd you in to those little gates, and you've got tens of thousands of people going through those little gates, 
and then you have to go through that that other it's 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 another little it's not a gate portico. it's a portico and so everybody gets in there and everybody is rushing but sometimes there's so many people there is no rushing how do you feel when you're around that many people that puts me on edge I want you to think of what it was like for Jesus that Jesus was surrounded by that many people and more everywhere he went. But it tells you over and over again that when he saw that kind of multitude, what did he do? What was his emotion? His emotion was he had compassion. He looked at them and he loved them. Why did he love them? Because he made them. These were his children. Can you imagine what it was like when he came into full understanding of who he was? What it was like before, when he was in heaven, when he understood that he made Adam and Eve, and he made this world, and in that process of that creation, he looked, and at the end he was able to say that it was very good, and the reason why he rested on the seventh day wasn't because he was tired, but because everything was perfect, there was nothing left to do, and he rested because it was perfect, and he gave us an example to rest in his perfection. Can you imagine what it was like when he came to this full understanding of this is what it was, and this is where I'm at now? The darkness, pain, suffering, the inhumanity that was pushed on him throughout his entire life. And it did not make him bitter. It did not make him want to seek revenge. But it made him have compassion because we are like sheep. God a shepherd. Brothers and sisters, as I close, what more can be said to make you fall in love with Jesus Christ? But I will say this. Turn with me one last text. That's going to be 1 John chapter 3. Verses 1 through 3. First John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Are you familiar with this set of verses? Oh, yeah. What does it say? What's the first word? Behold. behold. What does that word behold mean? Look. Look in amazement. See. See what God has done. Is there an answer for this? I can't explain it, but look what God has done. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us, that we should be called, what? Sons or children of God. Listen, brothers and sisters, this is what we are. You are a child of the living God. You are not the sinner. You are not the dirty one. You are not the leper. But you have been called as a child of the living God. Let's continue to read this. That we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Verse 3, And everyone who has this hope in Him does what? Purifies. Purifies what? Can not leave that second, one, that second word out? Everyone who has this hope in Him does what? Purifies, Purifies himself. Listen, this church has been blessed with this gift of prophecy, the spirit of prophecy. And in those writings we are told that God's church and God's people will have to do a work before the loud cry can come. And it is a special work that has to be done. Do you know what that special work is? It's the work of what, Ricky? Putting away of sin. Putting away of sin. I've heard this all of my Adventist life. And they've stopped teaching it because the people won't accept it anymore. Because they don't believe it. Because they don't believe it. That's because 
It's not that they don't believe this. They don't believe the power that Christ has to work in us. You understand? When I first heard it, I believed it. But then I saw the church make a change, and then I don't hear this message anymore, and I stopped thinking about it. But I've gotten to the point where I am tired of being here. I'm tired of wandering in the wilderness. And I believe that God is bringing us back. We've, we've, we've surged on. There you go. That word. We've wandered a long time. And we've wandered and we wandered. And God has brought us back. He brought us back. And now the focus is coming back on this. What is God calling for His people to be? And God says, plainly, that if we have this hope in us, that we purify ourselves. <clears throat> How does that work? Do I have to do it in my power? No. It is God's Spirit living in me, but I have to believe that He's able to do it. And I have to, by faith, step out and let Him do His marvelous work. But it will not happen if you don't fall in love with Jesus Christ. You will never understand this if you don't understand the love of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, that's all I can say to you. Know Him. Love Him. Let Him change you. Amen. Amen. Closing hymn this morning is hymn number 327. <coughs>
Father, as we close this service, Lord, I pray that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you will give us an experience with Jesus Christ that is so real, that, Lord, will finally convert us, that will finally change us, that will finally allow us to be used by you to show our neighbors, our family, the world, that you are real, that you love us, and that you can change us. Father, bless us. For this we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.